restaurants across Trinidad and Tobago, one of them having been operating for 15 years, announcing that they will be closing their Bistro Rustique as well as Jay Malone's. But could this just be on the service? Could in the coming weeks, in the coming months, if loans aren't given out, if some type of cash boost isn't given uh, for restaurants, could many more restaurants actually be closed. I want to welcome to the show Brian Fronten. He's the head of the Trinidad Hotel Restaurants and Tourism Association. He joins me via Zoom this morning. Brian, good to see you again. Morning, Ryan. Morning, Trinidad Tobago. What do you make of these two closures? And my first key question, you know, could this just be the service of things to come? Could we go deeper and have many more restaurants closed? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, the first sort of uh, reaction I would have is, is this is a very likely outcome when most restaurants and bars are considering that in dining and reopening on a limited basis or even further limited basis would be permitted from the 22nd of june and i found that they took the responsibility to communicate early o'clock with their patrons and you know if you if you examine some of the social media feedback very positive comments very um, uh, expectant and even disappointed uh, patrons but the reality is that you know restaurant business is a volume-based business that has very low profit margins and much of the cost is going to be um, labor, uh, your, your, your food and beverage inventory, your utilities, your rents. And these are things that were not um, serviced by way of revenue over the last few months. They were closed and a business needs to consider from the 22nd going forward when they're permitted to do more activity, what is the actual new normal in respect of consumer expected patronage and if that's not looking very high um, some businesses are taking a more proactive step this is not going to be the first of those in fact many businesses in this category are going to be strongly considering their options over the next few days brian what is required from a financial standpoint to ensure that our restaurant industry here in trinidad and tobago doesn't fall off a cliff yeah, and you know, just about six weeks ago, Ryan, you and I had a conversation about the precarious position right on this show and said that this food and beverage sector specifically would have needed a particular intervention as relates to a couple of things. One, um, payroll support going forward is key because yes, laid off status, temporary laid off status would have been the reaction to most restaurants when the in-dining was ceased in March 16th. As far back as March 16th, we've had um, hundreds, if not thousands, of affected employees who would have not been earning uh, their adjusted or their, 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 their tip-based uh, wages for that period of time. But these businesses, many cases, as much as landlords may, in very few cases, given breaks on rent, the fact remains is that these businesses have to decide what does their future look like, not so much the costs or the expenses that have been occurred to date. What needs to happen is there is going to be a very limited recovery period and all efforts must be made for them to prepare a healthy environment for reopening back to the public. Public confidence in getting out there and congregating and dining is extremely low. And if you look at even the, the ministry's health and safety guidelines that were released yesterday for restaurants and bars, the THRT, the TTBA have been working very closely with the ministry to have the protocols in place. Look at the social media reaction. People are saying, why are we going to open back restaurants and bars? It's a natural fear factor by yeah. the patrons and the public. Yeah, I also think, just to chime in to what you're saying and back it up, I just think that the public isn't, uh, at this point, uh, pretty much secured in their own finances as well to head back out Absolutely. to places of entertainment. But just to get back to the point I, I was making, um, a cash injection, a cash boost of some sort, do you foresee that this will be urgently needed by the restaurant industry? If they have, an, and I've been taken stock of the new normal, and what do I mean by that? how people are going to uh, consume food. And, and let, let's not forget that, that restaurants and bars and, and, and other of these entertainment areas are there for social gathering and celebration. People have found alternative ways to eat over the last uh, uh, two to three months, including starting home cooking. But going out to a restaurant is a particular experience. And many restaurants in the curbside and limited takeout and, di and, uh, and dining and delivery of that sort found 
different ways. They're definitely not as profitable because of the number of establishments and competition. But many of them need to consider first, and I'm saying first before a cash injection, what does your new 2020 horizon for the next six months going to look like? If you believe that you're you know, going to have that muted type of consumer reaction and you have a built restaurant space for a particular capacity, for seat covers and for turnaround, if you read into what is being said, we're closing our more location operations. So are businesses considering a different space, a different layout, a different type of business offering, a, a blended offering where we're going to be producing uh, meals to go or meals that are deployed to certain other channels, or are we going to scale back our dining areas mm -hmm. in the short term? Right. Much, many businesses like this type, Brian, are not owned the structures, they rent it. And they may have had a particular size and footprint based on an old model of high throughput. How do we know that we're out of the COVID? We're not out of the COVID environment. We are still within the throes of it. We have positive cases still being imported into Trinidad, which is a natural development when our citizens are coming back home. But the fact remains, we will not see the level of permitted gathering for the next three yeah. to six months. And that in itself is going to be a huge setback because, you know, Let's, let's just simulate it with the bus industry sure. right now. The buses are holding, what, 50% capacity. Mm -hmm. And if you have 50% capacity in, let's say, a restaurant or 75% capacity, that's a large chunk of revenue coming out of restaurants on a nightly basis. Absolutely. So, you know, we have developed the THR, the TTBA, a reinvention program that's currently launched yesterday that allows restaurants to get coaching and guidance on if reopening happens, how do you make sure your business is aligned to the protocols? And if you look at the protocols and the, and the health standards, we're asking for a reduction in capacity to begin with. So your footprint is already changed because of six foot and physical distancing. The number of boots, no standing, all of these other rules are in place. There's a limit of 10 persons a table maximum in, in, in certain cases. And that capacity is cut, rightfully so, because we're still trying to have some degree of control over gathering. But the other side of that coin is, is that reduced number of spaces going to be filled when a public has experienced increasing job losses, in the first instance, mm -hmm. yeah. um, salary cuts, two, and three, there is still a high degree of conscientious but fear-filled uh, citizens that are saying, I don't want to go outside because of all of the concerns and fears. Conditioning of being in a pandemic certainly leaves you with a lack of confidence. We are trying to stimulate that by having an independent assurance that restaurants that elect to open have followed the health and safety standards. The goal would be to partner with those that are willing to take the chance to open, and I'm saying it's taking a chance to reopen, but to do it in a manner that is safe and that communicates safety to, to, to the patrons and the public. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that reinvention program that was launched yesterday. People go to restaurants for the experience, for the ambience. What experience can they expect now? <laughs> it's a very good question, Ryan. You know, I, I, I mentioned to, to, to some of the initial cohorts that uh, it would be considered rude and even out of place to even see a, a, a team of cleaning staff or even um, um, sanitization staff walking through a restaurant just six months ago, you'll be, you'll be asking yourself a question, shouldn't you all have done that at the start before the doors open? And shouldn't you do that when we leave? I would say the new normal involves people visibly able, this is a patron, seeing persons wearing their masks, face shields, gloves, there's a contactless sort of system in place. There are ways in which there's uh, uh, barriers that protects the customer, of course, from, from other groupings. There's constant cleaning and sanitizing of, of restroom facilities. People are going to be looking more than ever, it's a hypersensitive environment, to where are the, the touch points and the management of the risk of flow of persons and what is this restaurant doing by way of the things we've grown accustomed to hearing. Sanitizing, PPE, social distancing, that people aren't congregating in a corner and causing any alarm bells. So you can see how the country, the consumers, the society, the patrons 
are conditioned to a new normal, right? I also want to mention there's evidence internationally, particularly in Florida, where the, the entire community, I would say both patrons and as far as businesses could have allowed, did not uphold these particular health and safety standards when they reopened bars and restaurants Had just a few closing. weeks ago. They closed mm -hmm. with 2,000 plus new cases every day. Now, we can't afford as an industry another 90 day lockdown. We just simply can't. So the, the, you know, the owners, we, what we came up with is how do we create capacity building and employee training, which is part of our program, so that everyone returns to this new normal sensitized and aware that this is not a checkbox exercise. Let me see everybody with a mask, etc. Okay, we're good to open. No, this is a mindset shift. If you are taking this risk of reopening, and I'm saying risk business-wise, first of course, um, to open back your doors come Monday and these next couple of weeks, please take stock of the fact that the public is watching and social policing is going to be at an all-time high. Yeah, that is certainly true. I just want to go back to the point of the finances because I know the finances is the bedrock, the foundation of this restaurant industry. Are there any grants available that many of these small and micro restaurants will be able to tap into at least to just survive until they can get their engines moving again? So whilst we made representation as early as March, we took surveys on March 18th and 19th and sent them to the Ministry of Tourism, sent them to the government subsequently. We said, at the end of the day, this sector is at risk because of the nature of their operations, which is constant traffic and flow of persons coming in, and they have some costs to carry for the period of time that they close. There aren't any specific industry measures what we're hearing is, of course, the SME uh, support. One of the concerns, your business needs to be within $1 million to $20 million overhead. So that's going to only cater for a particular size of restaurant that was able to do that. Uh, the NEDCO, I think, has been invited to do uh, smaller business types. Yes, there are, I could say, programs for any business that is falling within some very broad parameters to seek financial support in the short term by way of a, um, a soft loan, if you may call it that. I'm, I'm raising another point, Ryan. Walking into a financial institution and saying, I need a million dollars or $500,000 now, that is going to help me prop my business for, for three months going forward, is not a very uh, well thought out ask. What you need to be saying is, what is my staff complement going to look like for in dining at a limited basis? What types of meals and recipes do I want to consider given that the importation and supply chain link of food items may have been disrupted? And there may be price increases if I'm importing internationally. Do I have to change to a more local um, sort of flavor? How does it impact the taste and people's expectation? And how confident are consumers and how can I independently show, show them that I have put these systems in place. Have I, do I have an overbuilt um, seating capacity arrangement? Do I need to consider getting into food uh, preparation for curbside delivery or even prepackaged meals? These are the questions that need to go first before we talk about a funding sort of intervention. I am sparing a thought, Ryan, for the thousands of employees who have been temporarily laid off. And do we have the right labor mechanisms that's the concern. If you continue to leave 40% of your workforce, I, I, I believe that between 25 to 40% of the original workforce of the food and beverage operator may still need to be in a temporary layoff status just because of the math. Just the math. If you have lowered seating and you have lowered consumption patterns, how can the 100% staff count you had in March be out in, in, in June, July? If that's the case, Ryan, and we're crossing the 90-day window, what is the treatment for these hundreds of employees? I'm listening to you talk, Brian, and I can't help but think that this industry, tourism, um, restaurants, you know, hotels, it's just at a crossroads. Thank you very much, yeah. Brian, for being on the show this morning. I appreciate it. Welcome.
Brian Frontin, the chief executive officer of Trinidad's Hotels, Tourism and also Restaurants Association talking to us as two restaurants, mega restaurants, have been closed as well amid the COVID-19 pandemic. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, it's Men's Health Week. The chair of the Cancer Society here in Trinidad and Tobago will be talking to us about how they will be increasing awareness among men to take prostate cancer screening next.